going to need your, your help, actually. I would like us to do this talk together, in a way. I think that's the only way it's going to work. What I promise to do on my end is I promise to give you a talk, a, a story, actually, about an idea that I believe can really change the world. And what I would like to have from you, on your end, is an open mind. So, not a mind just open to be perhaps entertained or even inspired, but a mind open perhaps to revisit some of your deeply held emotions and beliefs. And then if we can do that, then maybe there's not going to be just one story tonight, there's going to be maybe hundreds of them, one for each one of us. So let's, leave, let's see if we, can, if we can manage that. There are no distractions, there are no slides. I, I don't know how to use slides anyway. So, um, so let's kick it off. And I'll, I'd like to kick it off with a question, actually. Do you have a secret? Do you have something, do you know something about yourself that nobody else does? Some, think about it for a second, some, you know, event that happened in the past, some, some maybe secret ambition, some deeply held emotion that you never shared with anybody. Think about this and focus on it and think about why you never shared this with anybody. Okay, maybe, maybe you never wanted to, okay? Maybe you just don't want to at all, but maybe actually under some conditions, under certain conditions, you would want to you think it would be good for you just to get it out there. But to put, it, to put it in very general terms, because I don't know the particular example, you're afraid of some sort of a consequence. And if that's the case, you actually you might be right. You might be right because we live in this real-life web of social relationships. And in these social relationships, we play roles, right? We play roles in each one of them, from the tenacious colleague to the friendly neighbor to the... I don't know, loving parent, faithful spouse. And these roles come with expectations, and there are things we can say or do that can affect these relationships, sometimes forever. Sometimes they can completely endanger, endanger them, actually. And because of that, in a very, very narrow set of cases, for a very, very narrow set of things, we keep quiet, we keep silent, and we keep some things just to ourselves. So are we paying a price for that? That's the question I want to ask. I'll give you a personal example very quickly. When I was younger, I used to be really scared of heights. And then to compensate, right? I, uh, I took up uh, rock climbing, I took up skydiving, extreme skiing, things like that, and I had fun doing these activities. But over time, what came to bother me even more than the fear itself was just looking at the friends around me, the people that I was doing these activities with. And they seemed completely unaffected, they seemed carefree, they seemed like they were not afraid at all. And they didn't know how I was feeling because I had never shared it with them. And because of that, there was this gap between us. And I felt a little bit detached, you know, however happy I was when I was with them, and however much fun I was having, I always kept this little grain of loneliness, let's call it this way. And that that kind of lack of perfect happiness, that one thing that was missing was the price that I was paying at the time. And you know what happened? You're not going to be surprised you know how, how that came to be sorted out. I spoke to a complete stranger about it. A complete stranger, a random person I met at some skydiving event somewhere in the United States, and uh, it was totally anticlimactic. It took just, just a few minutes, you know, the, me just saying something, the person acknowledging it, just, just for me to start actually to just get it out there and just to start thinking that how I was feeling was actually normal. It was nothing special. And that actually paradoxically made it easier later on to speak even to my friends about it, and it turned out not to be a very big deal. But that got me thinking, actually. That got me thinking. It was a very profound experience in a different way. It got me thinking, what if this sort of experience was just, just available to anybody in, a, you know, in an organized way, in a, in a, in a, just in a structured way, as a service? And, and I know you will tell me, well, that, that you know, already exists in, in some way. But what if this wasn't, what if this time we were not talking about some uh, awkward you know, religious experience or, uh, or a psychotherapy session? What if this was just a service that somebody was providing you, that you could just, for once, have an opportunity to just say something without consequences? Just, you know, the information that you share would be just destroyed, like a piece of paper in a, in a shredder machine, and nobody would, nobody would ever know about it. See, about four years ago, almost to the day, actually, on 
on a, on a winter, well, autumn, winter night, just like this one, I went out to test that concept with a group of friends. I was living in New York at the time in a neighborhood called Greenpoint in Brooklyn. And we went out and uh, we uh, took these little sticky notes. We posted them around the neighborhood and the sticky notes said, the Greenpoint Shredder. Okay, not the best name, I admit. 15 minutes, you talk, we listen, no judgment, everything forgotten. So I know it sounds weird, but we were at the time unemployed. I mean, most of us, so you have to understand. People come up with these ideas when they have, when they have time. Uh, and so, but lo and behold, you know, three days later, we got our first client, okay? The lady, it was snowing, I remember, the lady came in, she knocked on the door, I opened the door, she walked in, I saw her up the stairs. Um, I saw her into a living room, she was met by another lady from our team. There was a sofa there, the two ladies sat down, we offered the client some orange juice, some chocolate chip cookies. And then everybody left the room, the two ladies remained in there, they started speaking and they spoke for 15 minutes, and nobody will ever know what they spoke about. And I'll get back to that in a second. Voila, that was the start of a project then, right? And the project had ups and downs uh, over the next four years uh, because of our private lives and plans. But where does it find itself today? Well, today we have uh, more than a dozen teams working on five continents. Uh, teams of volunteers, by the way, providing completely free of charge service. And the service is the exact, the exact same thing that we offered on that very first night in Greenpoint, in, in New York. So these clients that come to these, um, these uh, appointments, their you know, skin color is different, maybe the language they speak is different, uh, they dress differently, the things in their mind are different. But the need they feel is the same, and the service they get is uh, exactly, exactly the same. What is going on here? What is... Uh, what is it that uh, attracts people to, to, um, you know, to want to come? That would probably be subject to a whole different, uh, whole different talk, but um, let's just say that we take it for granted, okay? Let's just say that we take it for granted that demand for the moment, according to our experience, outstrips supply by anywhere between 20 to 100 times to one. So we are booked more than, a, more than a year in advance, every single team. And uh, we need to find a way to cope with that, okay? We've actually recently even ta stopped taking new bookings just because we don't know what to do with the demand. Which brings me to <laughs> the second part of my talk. And actually, I'm going to be a little bit opportunistic here. I'm going to explain to you the inner workings of the project by trying to recruit you for it, if you indulge me, okay? Let's say the shredder is starting a new team next, uh, next year, somewhere in South Germany, which it is going to, actually. And let's say you are on that team, which you might be. And <laughs> I have to be careful because you're not supposed to be selling, right? <laughs> and uh, let's see what it would take. I mean, pe these people, they come. They come because they, you know, they feel the need, the need is established, they got the personal recommendation. The personal recommendation is a very important thing. They, uh, but they come more than anything because of this promise, of this promise of no consequences, of this promise of forgetting. So, oops, <laughs> how do you do that? I mean, we know memory is unreliable sometimes, we know memory is not exhaustive, we know all that, but is memory also manipulable? That's the question. And the answer is yes, and this answer has been known actually for, well, well since the dawn of psychology as a science, really. Back in the 19th century, there was a Stanford professor called Bergstrom. He, uh, he did a series of experiments that would later give rise to what is today known as the proactive interference theory of memory. So it's a very complicated concept to explain a very simple thing. Basically, the stuff you're trying to learn now is affected by the stuff you just learned or you learned recently, especially if the content is similar. So, for example, you're trying to learn a, a new phone number, but uh, you already learned a, a bunch of phone numbers just before. It, the task is almost impossible. So this is, this is the kind of tool you would be using. And so how would that be looking in practice? Well, let's say you're going to spend the entire day listening to stories of people, of clients. So you start your day by exposing yourself to some stories of people. And Maybe you'll be 
listening to recordings or watching videos or, or I don't know, listening, reading some books, maybe fiction, maybe real books, maybe uh, eth ethnographic studies, interviews, I don't know, everybody's different. Maybe you focus on some, some of your own experiences or experiences of, of another person that you heard about. Whatever you choose, the point is to really focus yourself on the experience, really immerse yourself in it so that it overwhelms you, so that it kind of blocks your senses in a way, overwhelms your senses. And that, when that happens, then you're ready to face your clients. And you, the first client comes in, you shake hands, you sit down, you have some small talk, and then you strike the clock, and then the time starts, and the person starts to speak, and you're engaged. You're asking, you're listening, you're asking some questions. You are, and they start to speak, and they speak about interesting things, boring things, private things, general things, um, charming things, crushing things, illegal things. But 15 minutes is a flash, and it just goes like that. And then another client comes in, and another, and another, and another. And then at the end of the day, their, their faces blur, their stories blur as well. And all that remains is this just, this, this mess of things in your short-term memory that then, after some time, basically just starts to decay. So all this is known to work. All this is known to scientifically proven to work. So there is just basically only one intuitive reason why we, we find it hard to, to, to wrap our minds around it. And that one reason is the question, what is preventing us from just thinking about something that is right there in the back of our minds? What is preventing us from recalling it actively, especially when we know we shouldn't be doing that? And we know that recalling actually reinforces the memory. What's preventing us from doing it? Well, what's preventing us actually is... Well, actually, let's, let's ask a different question. What's preventing uh, an Olympic athlete, for example, from drinking and partying with friends when they should be training? What's preventing a, a mother with a child in her car from speeding? What's preventing them is a certain sense, is a, is a discipline that comes from a certain sense of purpose. In this case, the purpose is a service, a very intimate service that you're providing to, a, to, to somebody else. Somebody else who gave you all their, basically, confidence and trust. Right? And this kind of discipline, by the way, is something that can be very, very useful, not only in this context, but also for your own private lives. And that, by the way, is, is again, <laughs> probably another another talk altogether, maybe something to think about on your way home. But actually, another thing, as I'm closing, that I would really like you to think about on your way home is, you know, okay, this is an interesting story, but what's the big picture? What is the big picture? Is this service something as important as, I don't know, fighting hunger or poverty in the, in the, in the world's most desperate regions? That, it would be hard to say that, right? But if we, if we leave those regions aside just for a second and we focus on our world, on the Western world, I mean, what's bothering us? Are we hungry? No. Are we poor? Not really. So then, are we perfectly happy? And if not, why not? See, I will assert something. I will put forward that we are not perfectly happy because who we are is different, slightly different, to who we pretend to be or are expected to be in this whole web of social networks around us. And because of this, I mean, we, we feel this impulse, this impulse for identity, for recognition, for, for morality, if you will. And forget psychology, forget religion. I mean, this impulse is as old as societies, human societies themselves. And that impulse remains unfulfilled. And because of that, we feel slightly detached with all these different roles to play. And the problem is, Mahatma Gandhi said, happiness is when what you think, you say, and you do are exactly the same thing all the time. So when you think of it that way, actually, what we're facing with here is a condition that is directly opposed to our happiness, directly opposed to it. And how many, I mean, how many people feel that way? I mean, how many tonight, at least a little bit? How many worldwide? I don't know, millions, hundreds of millions, I don't know. And what's the price that we're paying for that? Anxiety, depression, maybe worse. 
then, then, and, and then maybe it might make sense actually to treat this condition as poverty, as hunger, as, you know, I don't know, modern day slavery, to really try to make that effort, to really eradicate it, to really work for a day where, where, uh, where just anybody, anybody in the world could have somebody to speak to under these, under the shredder terms, so to speak, you know, just, just with no consequences. I don't know, digitally or face to face, I don't know, you know, in, in some way. And I don't know if that day will ever come, I don't know what the world will look uh, when that day comes, but one thing I'm really sure about is that that world will be literally and directly a happier place. Thank you.